welcome to Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and today I'm going to be talking about something that has been in the headlines for the last few weeks, maybe a month now, and that is the series of articles written by the Houston Chronicle about the sexual abuse scandal in the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, what the article is trying to do is trying to lay out a number of cases involving Southern Baptist Convention churches that were cases of sexual abuse by clergy members of people in the congregation, children in the congregation, uh, young people in the congregation. And they're trying to say, see, this is the Southern Baptist Convention's uh, sexual abuse scandal like the Catholic Church sexual abuse scandal. And what I want to say today in the video is that the parallels are not there. It isn't the case that the sexual abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church, this big decade long, decades long now, scandal that Catholic priests and bishops and certain cardinals have actually been accused of sexual abuse of minors, that does not have its parallel in the Southern Baptist Convention churches. And there are a number of different reasons why there is no true parallel between what is going on in the Southern Baptist Convention, which is more or less the results of sinful people who congregate together and express their sinfulness. This is a simply a characteristic of the fallen nature of man. Whenever you get people, fallen human beings, made in the image of God, but in rebellion with God in different ways, then you are going to have sin expressed itself in many different manifestations. And so what you're seeing in the Southern Baptist Convention or any Protestant denomination is the manifestation of sin coming and expressing itself in a visible public way. And unfortunately, this is going to take place no matter what. You're going to have scandal in the Christian church on occasion, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. If you go back to the early Christian church, Jesus chose 12 disciples, and one of them was a Judas. And if you have that as a foundation of the Christian church, you are seeing sin manifest itself even in the close proximity of Jesus Christ uh, through his apostles that he chose. So you have Judas who has um, fallen away and he betrayed the Lord and fell into sin at that close level. And so now you're going to see this happen continually all throughout church history. Now, that's something that the church has to improve on. We have to look at our systems. We have to look at our structures. We have to look at our accountability and say, can we do better? And of course, we can always do better and we need to do better uh, in ways of preventing anyone in the church, whether it's a volunteer or someone who is a leader in the church or someone who is the pastor of the church. We, ha we have to do better in policing ourselves and holding the leaders accountable and the members accountable and any volunteers who work with say, Sunday school or youth groups, we have to hold them accountable. We have to have better reporting systems so that if someone sees some instance or some hint of abuse, that that can be reported and can be dealt with before it becomes a major problem, and so on and so forth. There's always room for improvement within church structures. That's where the Southern Baptist Convention is, as far as I can understand. There isn't this systemic problem of child abuse within the Southern Baptist Church Convention churches. Now, 
On the other hand, the Roman Catholic Church has a structural problem. And this structural problem revolves around the very system of priesthood. The Roman Catholic Church has a all-male priesthood, an all-male single priesthood. So you have single men only who are leaders in the Roman Catholic Church. The bishops are only single men. The a pope can only be a single man. Archbishops, cardinals, all single unmarried men. Priests, all single unmarried men. The, this is an unhealthy balance of single men leading the Christian Catholic Church. Now, this is not the way the early church was organized. It was not populated by only unmarried single men. There were married men in the hierarchy of the early church. For example, the men that Jesus chose to be his disciples. We have the chief disciple, Peter, who was married. We know that because the scripture talks about his wife. It talks about his mother-in-law. It talks about his family structure. So we know that Peter himself, the chief among the apostles, the chief among the disciples that Jesus chose, was married. So we have precedent for a married clergy. And this is the way it was in the early church. This is the way it was and is in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the third major branch of Christianity. They have a married priesthood. They do restrict bishops from being married. Only single men can be bishops. But as far as the ordinary priesthood in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, they can be married or they can be single. And that's the way it really should be today in all churches. There should be single pastors of churches and there should be married pastors of churches. And there should be a mixture of single pastors and leaders in the church and there should be a mixture of married pastors and leaders in the church. That's the healthy balance for a healthy structure within the church. But what we see today in the Roman Catholic Church is a rule against married men serving in leadership in the priesthood, in the bishops, and in the cardinals, and of course the pope. So it's all single clergy, unmarried clergy in the Roman Catholic Church. That structure itself excludes all kinds of qualified leaders in the Roman Catholic Church. And what happens is if you don't have a structure that allows the qualified pastors and priests and bishops and hierarchy members in the Roman Catholic Church, what you're going to get is unqualified leaders. And that's what happens in the Roman Catholic Church right now. The Roman Catholic Church has and is filled with unqualified Christian leaders leading Christians. And the reason the Roman Catholic Church has a glut of unqualified leaders within its ranks is because it does not allow for married priests. It does not allow for a married clergy. If it, if it allowed for what the Bible outlines in the New Testament as leaders in the church, if it allowed for married clergy like the Apostle Peter and others, if it allowed for those, then it would have more than enough qualified men to lead in the church. And so it wouldn't have to draw forth from the pool of unqualified men. What is happening right now is that because it has this silly rule of celibacy, married uh, men are excluded from leadership. And so then what has to happen is the church has to recruit a boatload of unqualified single men. And guess what is going to happen? You're going to draw from this unqualified single pool of candidates for leadership in the church, and you're going to be drawing in a lot of single unqualified men, such as homosexuals and pedophiles and all kinds of twisted and perverted single men, because you're not allowing 
for a healthy balance of single and married men. And so that's what's happened in the Roman Catholic Church. They have drawn forth from a pool, a corrupted pool of men, simply because they have a rule that doesn't allow for married men to be priests. So the solution for the Roman Catholic Church is that they need to allow their priests to be married because there's no rule in the Bible that says they shouldn't and there's no biblical, there's no divine, there's no spiritual rule that says they shouldn't have married men. And so they just simply need to admit, hey, we don't have enough qualified leaders in our church. The ones that are in place now are not qualified. And because they're not qualified, because they don't meet the certain standards, the strict standards, the Bible outlines, we have been recruiting a lower level of leaders. And then from those lower level leaders, we're getting all kinds of bad results. And one of the bad results is that children are being molested in this corrupt system of leadership within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there is child abuse taking place in Protestant churches. There are There is child abuse taking place in Baptist Church, in Methodist Church, in Methodist Wesleyan Church, in Congregational Church, in Assembly of God churches. Yes, that is going to happen. And there's no system on earth that's going to weed out all the bad people that might sneak in, whether single or married. Now, we should say right off the bat that all of the cases of child abuse are not committed by single pedophiles. Some of the people who are committing these crimes against children are married. And so it's not just a matter of all single people in the, in the priesthood or in the pastorate are committing these crimes. It's also married people who are committing these crimes. So you're going to get that. Why do you get that? Because humans are corrupt. This is what the reformers taught over and over and over. And I guess a lot of evangelicals, a lot of even Bible-believing Christians don't really take it seriously. But the human race is corrupt. Men and women are corrupt. Even born-again Christians are corrupt because they still have to struggle and a fight against sin and temptation in their life. They still have to resist the devil on a daily basis. They still have to resist the pull of the world to materialism. You're always going to get financial corruption, sexual corruption. You're going to get adultery. You're going to get fornication. You're going to get all kinds of sins. You just name it. You're always going to get that in the church. That's going to happen occasionally. And that's the way we want to keep it occasionally because of the human corruption of the soul. People do not automatically become perfect. They don't become holier than the saints, if you want to put it that way. They don't all become a Mother Teresa. They don't all become a Billy Graham just because they become Christians and they don't all become sanctified just because they've been going to church for a long time or when they read their Bible every day or pray every day and do any of the spiritual disciplines. They don't become perfect people because we have to remember that everyone is susceptible at some point in their uh, life and at certain times of their life to certain sins. And so that's why we need to be vigilant, we need to pray, we need to ask God to give us the strength to resist all forms of sin. But realistically, and the Bible outlines this, it says in 1 John, for example, it says, I write these things so that you do not sin, but if anyone does sin. So in other words, I'm writing to you that we can become holy, but if someone does fall into sin, then we have a process whereby we come to Christ, there's confession, there's repentance, there's restoration, there's restitution in some cases, and you need to 
have a process of dealing with people who are sinners and who fall into sin. So that's going to take place occasionally in the church, any church. It took place, we saw, I already mentioned Judas in the New Testament, one of the chosen apostles of Christ, the disciple that uh, Jesus handpicked, and one out of the 12 went bad. It's going to happen in the Christian church, and there's nothing we can do about it. We need to try to improve our structures, our accountability structures, our reporting structures. We need to build healthy systems for volunteers to work. We need to build screening process, background checks. Whatever it takes, we need to do to get this corruption that is always going to be to some extent in any organization. We shouldn't just single out the church. If you look at, for example, the public school system, there is so much corruption taking place. There is so much sexual abuse taking place. There is so much um, uh, sexual sin that's taking place between teachers, administrators, and students. Uh, there's pedophilia there's child abuse, there's all kinds of things. You don't hear a lot about that in the press because for some reason, secular media doesn't like to talk about that. They just want to focus on uh, church abuse and try to build this image that is only taking place in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, we all know that's not true. Any organization, any group is going to have bad apples and you want to minimize those bad apples as much as possible but realistically speaking you're not going to get rid of all the bad apples and there is going to be some kind of manifestation of sin in whatever church you're talking about in the southern baptist convention there are going to be bad apples there are going to be corrupt clergymen there are going to be instances of adultery financial impropriety, um, child abuse, on and on. You just name the sin, it's going to be there to some extent. But what we want to try to do as Protestant leaders is we want to minimize that as much as possible. And I believe that the system that we have of leadership, as far as opening it up to both single and married men, is the most healthy biblical structure of all. Um, there should be a good mixture of singles and married in the, in the Christian church. That's what the Bible outlines. We don't suffer from the same structural problems as the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church suffers from its structural problem because it excludes married clergy. And so, like I said before, it has to draw upon a very weak single population to basically uh, fulfill all of its leadership requirements. And that is hurting its structure and that's hurting its internal integrity. Um, obviously the Catholic priests that are there right now that are committing these atrocious crimes against children and also young adults. We should also say that this latest wave of scandals within the Roman Catholic Church, that is not pedophilia. That's abuse of power and abuse of position. For example, the latest, the Theodore McCarrick scandal, he was mostly preying upon seminary students, these young teenagers and young 20-something boys of seminary age he was preying upon them using his power and position over them. He was preying upon them. That's not pedophilia. That's a different type of corruption. But it's the same basic problem, and that is they're recruiting all single and non-married men for leadership. If they would open up the ranks, they wouldn't have to draw from that limited pool of really good leaders who are single and they could open up the pool of candidates for leadership to the married qualified men and they would get a whole lot more and better qualified leaders. It's just simple mathematics 
and there's no good reason why they can't. And I, I really believe that in the future we, we are going to see married priests in the Roman Catholic Church. I think it's a necessity. Um, it needs to happen as quickly as possible. And I think that really um, progressive, not I shouldn't say progressive, that carries political baggage. I should say far thinking and open-minded Catholic leaders are going to come to the realization that they have painted themselves into a corner. Uh, the results of that we are seeing today with these pedophile scandals and uh, sexual abuse scandals in the Catholic Church, that is all due to these unqualified and poor and corrupt leaders within the Roman Catholic structures. To get those leaders out, they need to kick them out. They need to flush that whole generation out and replace them with new leaders. Now, they don't have enough qualified single men, so they need to open the ranks to married men. They do that, they begin to transition and become a more healthy church. But as a Protestant, I also would have all kinds of other criticisms of the Roman Catholic Church, but it's based on the same problem. It's a traditional-based church. It's based on traditions made by men through the centuries and that gets them into trouble. If they go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible tell us about this, that, and the other, then they will be able to reform. But as far as the Southern Baptist Convention, as far as opening the clergy to uh, singles and married men, they already do that. So that's sound, that's solid. There is no network or hierarchy within the Southern Baptist Convention that is trying to cover up any abuse. There is no network of pastors who cover up because of the structure. There is no hierarchy within the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, there is no uh, central organization within the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, some people try to parallel the annual meeting um, and the president of the Southern Baptist Convention with the Pope and the Vatican. There's no comparison at all. Totally different kind of structure at all. Uh, the independent Southern Baptist churches that make up the convention, they generally don't follow anyone but their own local church. They cooperate enough to pool their money together for missions purposes. And they all agree on, for example, the fa Baptist faith and message as a doctrinal statement of faith that they all agree with. But as far as the Southern Baptist Convention hierarchy somewhere in Nashville calling the shots in the individual Southern Baptist Conventions, no, they don't. They don't have that authority. And so it's totally different than the Roman Catholic Church structure authority. So there really is no parallel between the sexual abuse problem within the Roman Catholic Church, that ongoing problem, and what the Houston Chronicle outlined in their expose of certain cases of child abuse within SBC churches. Totally different situation. Um, can the Southern Baptist Convention, the presidency, and the committees do better and improve and encourage individual churches in the SBC to take more uh, measures of accountability and structural changes that can help the situation? Yes, and they should. And that's what good leadership does. It says, hey, local churches, uh, here is a plan try this out for accountability, try this out for screening out volunteers, try this out for reporting, improving uh, reporting, try this out. It, you know, we're all learning how to weed out bad apples and how to spot uh, potentially dangerous people within our churches. Because after all, we want our churches to be accessible to the public. We want people of all stripes to be coming into our churches on Sunday morning and volunteering for ministries during the week and so on and so forth. We want a free access within churches. 
But on the other hand, we want to have structures that safeguard Sunday school children, youth group children, uh, all kinds of vulnerable children. We want the church to be a safe place for them to come and learn about God and not have and parents do not have to worry about their children and whether there's someone within the church that's a danger to them. We want to be able to spot those dangerous people and deal with them and show them the door um, or uh, call them to repentance and have them go for counseling and keep them away from children or whatever we have to do. We want to make sure that everybody's safe and sound and we want the church to be healthy and thriving and growing. And we want to have Christians who are maturing and are able to help lead their families and raise children. And we want good things to come about. And so uh, these are areas that can be improved within the SBC, the Southern Methodist Convention. But I sure hope that the SBC leadership doesn't begin to take upon itself this heavy burden of saying, oh, we have the same problem as the Roman Catholic Church as far as sexual abuse. We don't have that same problem. I have not seen evidence that there, that there is anything even close to that problem. And we shouldn't allow the secular media to blow up the instances, the occasions where there is a legitimate sexual abuse situation happening in an SBC church to try to broad brush the whole uh, denomination, SBC, and, the, uh, and all of the church and saying, oh, you're just like the Roman Catholic Church. That is totally false. It's a totally different structure, totally different system. And the problems that we deal with are the ones that we should be dealing with. And we should be working to find solutions to keep children safe, teenagers safe, everyone safe within the walls of the church. But the, the problems the Roman Catholic Church has are all of a different type. And that is their whole structure needs to be altered. They need to have a healthy clergy, healthy hierarchy. And that comes about by radical changes. So I just hope that this helps you. And we'll talk to you later in, in another edition of Christian Answers. God bless. Hey.